I have this wonderful pleasure. I'm Stefan Eckert. I'm a visiting faculty member from uh, Eastern Illinois in music. And because we are sharing the same discipline, I'm asked to introduce Douglas. And I have to admit, being both a music theorist and a more an academic, uh, Douglas basically is both. He is a performer as well as an instrument builder. And so he is probably the best person to present to you ideas about this instrument, about the music, and uh, really has an intimate knowledge about how both the mechanic and, of course, the musicality flow together to create the music that was written for this instrument. Now, Douglas is both trained uh, and, and has uh, played concerts as both an organist and harpsichordist, which is quite unique because uh, it means, as an organist, he also can use his feet. Um, which usually harpsichord players do not. Uh, and so that additional uh, ability to, in fact, uh, coordinate both hands and feet is, uh, I'm completely in awe because I cannot even coordinate my hands. <laughs> um, now, Douglas has many recordings and he has a concert both in Europe, extensive concerts in Europe and Australia. And he has also many recordings to his name. And in fact, last weekend I had a chance to listen to some of his books, the Hude recordings, and I'm an 18th century person myself. But books, the Hude struck me always as somewhat dry North German music. And please, if you have the same impression as I have of books, the Hude, well, listen to Douglas's recordings because they're beautiful music. It beautifully flows, has a great dynamic, and <coughs> it is worth really listening to it. So uh, it should make you a books, the Hude lover out of. You, if you are not already. <laughs> now, today, this evening, uh, we hear no books to do this, but of course, uh, Bender, Bach, Haydn, uh, and most important, of course, is C.P. Bach. It's not J.S. Bach, it's C.P. Bach, so Bach son. Um, and I think, without further ado. Good evening. Thank you for your welcome. And the idea that you keep whispers you will understand as you listen, particularly when I get to the main performance part of the program. I'm going to play very shortly one movement of a Bender Sonata, as you see on your program, uh, and then the main part of my lecture, and then return to the instrument to play the remainder of the program. As you listen, you will realise, after a time, that the instrument has become louder. It hasn't. Your ears have adjusted, and this is why any sort of loud noise or interference immediately disturbs that sort of equilibrium of, of, of hearing. Um, and they're the quietest, but also the most sensitive of all the keyboard instruments. The strings are struck by a brass blade called the tangent in the back of each of the keys. The string sounds from that striking point to the bridge, and if you're a physicist, you will understand why the instrument then is so quiet, because you're energising a string at the end of its vibrating length, which is the most inefficient way of energising a string, at a node uh, where the string vibrates and you have that point of closure. And so this is why they're so quiet. But, but, because through the finger you are immediately in direct contact through the tangent at the back of the key, you're in direct contact from finger to string, you can play a vibrato, which is called in German of the period of C.P. Bach, Bebu. C.P. Bach actually notates in some of his music where you were to use this vibrato. And um, so whilst the dynamic, the overall dynamic level is very low, the gradations of dynamic are large. And as I said, after a while, the instrument will uh, sound louder than at the outset. Um, so the first piece in the program is the first movement of a sonata in C minor. And you'll notice I've put dates with everything. And a lot of the music that I'm playing coordinates with the original that Arnold Dolmetsch owned, the 1784 Hoffman clavichord, which this is copied from. And 
I've tried to keep as much of the programme centred on that later 18th century period. Um, the Bohemian composer Yashi Bender, uh, Germanicised to go, his older brother Frantischek, Franz Bender, was the leader of Frederick the Great's orchestra. Um, Yishi, for some years, worked alongside C.P. Bach at the court of Frederick the Great. Um, so he knew C.P. Bach very well. He knew C.P. Bach's fame as a clavichordist, uh, and obviously would have heard him a number of, of times. And he specifically comments that the clavichord is a perfect vehicle for the realisation of these sonatas. Uh, and the style of writing corresponds with the emphinsomkeit, or sensibility in music, which was so popular at this time. C.P. Bach was known as a great exponent of this musical style, wishing to express many affects closely following on one another, something you'll certainly notice later in the programme tonight in La Capriccius, which is the most extraordinary piece. Um, so, without further ado, here is the first movement of the C minor sonata, uh, by Bender. And before I play it, just to, to, to show you, if I play a note straight, if I play it with the bebung, with the vibrato, and it colours the sound. And this is used a lot as a, um, a vehicle for, for coloration. Peering out of the mists of time, Arnold Dolmetsch. Um, and, and curiously, we see all these pictures of Dolmetsch uh, in his satin and his velvet and his buckled shoes and his, all his period uh, paraphernalia that he wore for performing. And he looks much more of a man, as it were, than he was, because he was actually very little taller than Katie, who's doing the video. 
He stood at about five feet. So he was tiny. Um, he is the person at the centre of this evening's lecture. And he was born in Le Mans, in France, Swiss, French parentage. And because of the time uh, problem tonight, fitting as much in as possible, I can't give a detailed biography, but a brief resume will help to give you a context. His early training as a musician was with violin, and in his father's organ building and piano repair workshop, he learnt the craft of instrument making. This duality of performer and maker was to define his life, and his curiosity about old instruments was to lead to restoring and then copying, not just keyboard instruments, such as the clavichord and harpsichord, but also lutes and viols and various other uh, slightly more exotic instruments that, that he researched. He also, of course, wasn't just researching the instruments. He was digging around in the archives, he was digging around in the libraries, finding music to perform, um, and researching the performance practice on these instruments. So, after Arnold had a whirlwind marriage to his first wife, Marie, they first visited England and then the USA, but soon returned to France. He then studied at the Brussels Conservatoire for four years, before once again removing to London. Here he decided to enrol in the new Royal College of Music in 1892, the first principal of which was Sir George Grove of Grove's Dictionary of Music fame. If there are any, any musicians here will know about Grove, because that's your first recourse if you need to look something up. Um, where among his tutors uh, was a certain Sir Hubert Parry. On completion of a year there, uh, he was appointed as a violin teacher at Dulwich College, and it was in Dulwich in 1894 that he made his first four clavichords and began to study how the old instruments were constructed, both restoring and copying them. Uh, and here he is playing not the Hoffman original of this clavichord. Uh, we don't know actually what this instrument was. It's a Saxon instrument of the same type. Um, but it, it has a divided lid, whereas the Hoffman has the full width lid in one piece. Um, so we don't know which instrument this is. Also during this period, that his first marriage having broken down, he married his second wife, Elodie, a first class pianist. His first harpsichord was made at the suggestion of William Morris of Arts and Crafts fame and exhibited at the 1896 Arts and Crafts Exhibition in London. Arnold rapidly made a large circle of friends in the Arts and Crafts movement and beyond, and Morris, Selwyn Image, Herbert Horne and Edward Byrne Jones provided the ideal philosophical and aesthetic framework for his talents. Writer and cricket, critic uh, George Bernard Shaw was an ardent admirer of the ancient music which Dolmetsch was discovering in the archives, editing and performing. The unusual for the time and attractive presentations of this early music on the instruments for which it was written, and the searching out of original material, whether music manuscripts or old instruments to use or copy, became a total passion for Arnold and his family and friends. A first tour in America took place in 1902, and the Astors were added to the extraordinary list of famous and wealthy people Dolmetsch cultivated. In 1903, Arnold collaborated with the dancer Isadora Duncan in Paris, demonstrating his ability to provide music for a variety of stage performances, often improvised uh, on the spur of the moment, or compositions that he wrote out himself to fit, in this case, uh, Isadora Duncan's dancing. Then in 1904, uh, the family returned to America. But by now, the second marriage had broken down, and Arnold married his one-time student and musician in the group, Mabel Johnston, a marriage that would endure for the rest of his long life. 
the youngest son of that union, Carl, becoming well known in his own right after the Second World War as a recorder player and director of the family business, which by that time was long established at Hazelmere in England. Returning, say, to 1904 and that second visit to America, this tour ended up with the decision to stay, initially in Chicago. One of the engagements during this tour was with Ben Greet's Shakespearean Company, providing music on stage, in costume of course, uh, for his productions, in which a young Sybil Thorndike was proving the star she would become. <coughs> The 1784 Hoffman clavichord, on which this instrument here was based, uh, was owned by Dolmetsch at this time and had gone to America with him. The Chicago interlude enabled him to repair it after a careless railway porter had sent it crashing to the ground along a station platform. Can you believe mm. a, a priceless 18th century instrument um, just sort of having it stacked on top of a luggage on the platform? Anyway. I can't believe that, but uh, <coughs> life is different now, and these instruments are much more valued uh, and valuable, of course. During that second uh, visit, um, they performed in Boston, and one of the representatives of the Chickering Piano Company invited Arnold to set up a department in the factory to manufacture harpsichords, clavichords, and other instruments, other early instruments. Thus, starting the period in the USA making instruments based on or copied from old originals, and a return to using his already considerable experience in instrument making. Uh, there is the Chickering factory in 1865, their early <coughs> emporium burnt down in the 1850s, uh, and I haven't been able to find the reference again, but I'm sure I've read somewhere that. I mean, I know they employed a huge workforce, but I think it was something like 17 or 1800 employees making pianos. They were one of the leading piano manufacturers in the USA uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. And when a certain Steinway arrived in New York uh, off the, uh, the boat from, from Europe, from Germany, one of the first things he did was to go to a concert where one of the Chickering Grands was being played, and they could hardly prize him away from it at the end, he was so interested. So, even the roots of Steinway's work uh, come back to Chickering's in Boston. Then, like Paris, Sal Player and Sal Gabor, they had their, the, the instrument makers, piano makers, had their own uh, little concert halls. So did Chickering's. <coughs> Uh, and that is a somewhat run down picture, I think, probably after they'd sold it. I think they sold it in 1903. Um, so before Dolmetsch uh, was, was there in Boston. But, but this was a big, very, very prestigious business that he was asked to set up a department in. Um, up to 1910-11, when the slump in America closed this side of production at Chickering's, some 74 harpsichords and clavichords were made, of which 34 were copies based on the Hoffman, of which mine is the penultimate of the series. The number 51 on this is because the series of keyboard instruments were numbered chronologically regardless of type, so the harpsichords and the clavichords were just numbered together. Um, and you can see if in the list of uh, books and web references that I've put on the back of the programme. Uh, there is one there, Peter Babington's list of the clavichords up to 1914 uh, of Dolmetsch. If you're interested to see exactly what is known about all of the, the Boston-made clavichords, they're all listed there, all the chicory instruments are listed there. Um, Arnold Dolmetsch throughout his life mixed with and was supported by an extraordinary number of famous people. And they didn't get much more famous in the USA at that time than President Roosevelt, to whom Dolmetsch played a clavichord in the White House during his years with the Chickering Company. He did manage to cultivate the most extraordinary list. Uh, if you wanted to name drop, my goodness me, what a man he would have been. 
An idea of how extraordinary the instrument making of Dolmetsch was up to 1914 can be seen in the fact that from 1894 he made in excess of 50 clavichords of various designs during this period, as well as the harpsichords, viols, lutes, and all the performing he was doing. The Hoffman clavichord, the original, he sold to Bell Skinner in Boston before returning to France in 1911, and together with other instruments of her collection, they're now in the Yale University collection, together with the first Dolmetsch copy of it, and two others from 1907 and 1908. And here is that original clavichord, which you can see in the Yale collection. Um, just a very plain trestle stand, uh, you can see what I mean, the, the, the complete lid exactly like this one, except that it's on a chord leaning back rather than what Dolmetsch did. What Dolmetsch has done with the music stand is exactly from English square pianos. So you can see that, that isn't an 18th century thing, but it's a very neat idea. And there is number one, and you can immediately see the family resemblance to the one sitting in front of you. Um, except that the, the, the stand here is, is basically the same as the original trestle stand, except but he's prettified it, he's arts and crafted it by putting nice, pretty turned legs instead of the plain legs of the previous one. Um, in total, 13 of these clavichords are in such prestigious museum collections as the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Smithsonian Institute, the Barton Oaks, and Harvard University, and of course, Boston. Uh, the, the Yale University collection. Um, Chickering's allowed Arnold pretty much free reign. He could choose the best craftsman for his team, the best materials, and not worry about profit. In fact, a dream come true. And thinking of materials at one time earlier in the 19th century, Chickering's had their own ship that brought wood from South America and took instruments back to sell in return. And can you imagine a business like that? It's just so, so extraordinary <coughs> to us today um, that you could do things like that. So this is number seven of the chronology of harpsichords and clavichords. And this is a particular interest picture because what you can't see really at all, unless you get very accurately against the light, on this instrument, because it's painted, are these wonderful, beautifully cut dovetails on all the corners of the instrument, which are exactly as the original was put together. It's exactly the same as the Hoffman original. Um, and it's exactly the same on this one. The fact that this is now over 100 years old, and you can barely see these joints showing through the paint, is testimony to the materials and the craftsmanship, uh, both of which I think were well, almost beyond first class. So certain were the family about staying in America that they soon commissioned a house to be built in Cambridge, Massachusetts, designed so that the spaces could be used in various flexible ways for musical performance. And I haven't got pictures of the house, but there is Arnold at Chickering's in 1907, uh, playing one of his harps. As you see, this one, and it's got pedals to operate the registers, the stops on, on the heart to change the, the, the sort of sound that you can get, which would have been hand stops on a historical instrument. This was one of the improvements, as he saw it, that he began to introduce. And then there's a, two pictures of number 16 of the Dolmetsch Chickering Outbook from 1907, one of his big two manual harpsichords, um, this is the sort of instrument uh, that the American harpsichordist Ralph Kirkpatrick uh, would have used quite extensively. And actually Kirkpatrick owned one of these clavichords as well uh, and thought very highly of it. And then a detail here, and you probably can't see most of you from where you are, but if, if you look later you can see the gold leaf lettering and the Latin uh, numerals for the date. Uh, and the V for the U of USA, it, it looks so strange to us, doesn't it, when you see the Latin, the Latin lettering. But that is exactly the same, exactly the same on all these instruments. 
In these early days of the early music revival, Dolmetsch was quite conservative in how he used the knowledge accumulated from the old instruments and his restoration work. Knowledge uh, particularly accumulated um, over all these years from the 1890s, and particularly in the large clavichords, such as those made in the 1890s, based on the Haas of Hamburg, or those made at Chickering's, he altered very little from the original design. The Chickering harpsichords, as we can see here, um, often have a 16-foot register, they have pedals to change the registers. He is beginning to think, I must improve, which was actually, after the First World War, in some respects, to be the downfall of the quality of his instruments. And most commentators say that the best instruments that Dolmetsch ever made were those he made at Chickering's in Boston. Um, it's instructive to look at a direct comparison of the Chickering clavichord and the Hoffman original. Uh, the lower one is, is, is mine uh, taken as much as I could from directly above. The picture above is actually not the 1784 Hoffman that Dolmetsch owned, but it's the same maker and it's the same year, and it's the one which is in the Cobb collection here in the UK. And the crucial elements to look at are the layout of the soundboard. Look at the shape of the bridge, this S shape here on the Dolmetsch instrument, and what is called a walking stick bridge, which is typical of the Saxon instruments uh, <clears throat> on the original. Look at the placement of the rest plank and the angle of the tuning pins running across the soundboard. You see Dolmetsch has moved the angle back a little, so you have a little more soundboard area here for the uh, mid to treble of the bridge. Treble end of the bridge, exactly the same place as the original, and this S shape has very little impact on string length and sound. And there's a particular reason, I think, why he did that. The North German clavichords that he copied in the 1890s uh, always had the S shape of bridge. The walking stick bridge, because of its predominantly straight line, when you pull strings across it, you have to pull them at an angle and down in order to get the contact with the bridge. And it makes the bridge roll. And to stop the bridge rolling on the soundboard, the bridge then has to be grooved instead of having too much bearing of the string on the bridge. Dolmetsch would have known that. He also would have known that the S-shaped bridge is much more stable. You can see it's obvious from its shape that it's going to have much more stability on the soundboard. And I think that's the reason uh, why he made those quite carefully considered uh, changes. Otherwise, the instrument is essentially pretty much identical to his original. His original, yes, did have two roses, not one. And you can see his lower rose is in exactly the same place as in the original. You can also see just about um, that the, the, the carving of the keys, uh, and I've got a close-up picture of, of the carving to show you, but the carving of the keys is an exact copy of the carving on the Hoffman original. Yes, there we are. There is the carving. And I've, I've carved clavichord keys. I made three copies of one of the Haas clavichords that Dolmetsch copied in the 1890s. And carving clavichord keys, believe me, is jolly difficult to get that precision. He must have had the most fabulously good wood carver uh, of the Chickering work, workforce. Uh, and I know the woodcarver was one of the ones who decided to call it a day when that department closed in 1910-11. Um, Chickerings were proud of what Dolmetsch was doing and realised that his name was an important selling point. And this can be seen in the detail of the roses with the A.D. Arnold Dolmetsch initials incorporated and I've done to the, they're the same picture, but I've just highlighted in, I hope you can see, the A and the D, because in the tracery of the roses, initially it's quite hard for the eye to pick that up. Then around each of the roses, these are cast metal and then gilded, 
Um, and actually not such a strange thing to do. Many, many roses on harpsichords in the 18th century were cast with organ metal, um, alimony of, of uh, lead and um, tin. Uh, and very easy metal to cast in. And it has the same <coughs> inscription as there is in Indian ink at the back of this instrument. This is exactly what is inside this, this clavichord at the back of the base of the keyboard. And this pride in both his workmanship uh, and in the uniqueness of what he's doing was one of the, obviously, one of the key selling points uh, of these instruments. And it's easy to conjecture what might have happened had the slump not caused the closure of this enterprise after such a short time. Dolmetsch almost certainly would have remained working in Boston and the balance of the early music revival internationally would have looked quite different. However, in 1911, he returned to France, and up to 1914, when he returned to the UK, he had a similar, if not so satisfying, relationship making instruments in the Gavot piano workshops in Paris. And interestingly, Gavot wouldn't allow his name on the instruments. Isn't that sad? And how silly. What a silly thing because Chickering's absolutely understood, you know, what a pot of gold they had in, in Dolmetsch. Uh, and in fact, after the recovery, financial recovery, following the Second World War, um, Dolmetsch did actually pick up his connection with some of the people that he'd been friends with in Chickering's. So it wasn't, as it were, a complete sort of dead end in the road. It's both interesting and instructive to look at the long list of musicians and instrument makers he inspired or taught. Among the harpsichord makers were John Chalice, the American maker who, after his apprenticeship of four years in the Dolmetsch workshop in the late 1920s, uh, at Hazelmere, in fact, this was in England, uh, went completely non-traditional, with aluminium frames and even aluminium soundboards. Uh, and Ralph Kirkpatrick actually used um, Chalice instruments a lot for his concert work were very stable, apparently. William Dowd, the Boston maker from whom Chris Hogwood bought this clavichord, started out <coughs> with an apprenticeship with Chalice, and then went on in 1949 to form the partnership with Frank Hubbard, which was to be the bedrock of the resurgence in interest in period instruments in Boston. And Boston still is one of the key places in the USA, indeed internationally, for early music. Robert Goebel, who founded the English firm of harpsichord and clavichord makers that bears his name, uh, met his wife when working with Dolmetsch as an apprentice. Uh, and in fact, I, mean, I have a long contact with, with Goebel's and Robert's son, Andrea, who is now himself, I think probably getting into his 80s, is still someone that I'm, I'm in fairly regular contact with. Um, of scholars, probably the best known in the early music world is Robert Donington, musicologist and the first secretary of the Dolmetsch Foundation for many years, who took forward Dolmetsch's work on performance practice in his two hugely important books on the subject. And th those are listed in the little bibliography that I've, I've put on the back of the, the programme. The British harpsichordist Violet Gordon Woodhouse uh, had many instruments, including clavichords from Dolmetsch. Lord Berners, whose Rolls Royce had a special compartment for his little Dolmetsch clavichord under one of his seats. <laughs> Can you imagine it? It's wonderful. And of course, the American harpsichordist and clavichordist that I've already mentioned, Ralph Kirkpatrick, whose name lives on as the K in the Scarlatti catalogue numbers. All of these owed much uh, directly and indirectly to Arnold Dolmetsch. Interesting as well, as I've said, that Kirkpatrick owned one of these clavichords, which he regarded very highly. And he did meet Arnold Dolmetsch at Hazelmere um, when uh, Dolmetsch was already quite an elderly and I think fairly irascible man. Um, and as with the comments that uh, Ralph Kirkpatrick has, about Landowska in Paris with whom he studied. Um, he, he, there's a new book of 
the, all the correspondence of, um, of Ralph Kirkpatrick, which is absolutely fascinating. And my goodness me, it's good for a laugh in places, because the things he calls Landowska, today you wouldn't get away with that at all. Definitely not. Um, so, here is a man who was, in truth, an inspiration to so many, and laid the foundations for much of the further exploration of what we loosely call early music. In particular, he provided the springboard for the American resurgence of harpsichord and clavichord making, just as much as he did in the UK and Europe, making it a truly international movement right from those early days. Before I go back to the clavichord to play, I just want to thank three people in particular who've, who've helped a tremendous amount since I bought this instrument just nearly a year ago. Peter Babington, who restored it for Chris Hogwood. Um, my old friend Derek Adlam, from whom the suggestion of rustling your programmes came. <laughs> One of the UK's leading players of the clavichord, and until some years ago, uh, Derek, of course, a leading maker as well. And Richard Troger from California, uh, who is the leading expert on these dolmetsch chicker and clavichords. He owns two of them himself and whose advice unstintingly given has enabled me to improve this instrument in many subtle but important ways. And I don't know how many emails that I've batted backwards and forwards with Richard over the last year. So, without further ado, back to the real focus of this evening, which is the music. I should perhaps just explain a tiny bit about what you're going to hear next. Because what you're going to hear next is a sonata in F. But it's a composite sonata, because I couldn't fit a whole sonata in this evening's programme, because there was too little time. And I came across movements by different composers that I really, really loved. And in fact, the Haydn slow movement that I'm playing is just so fabulously wonderful on this instrument. And I suddenly thought, oh, well, why not do a composite sonata? So you have C.P. Bach for the first movement, Haydn for the second, and Ishi Bender again for the last movement. The C.P. Bach is the only one which is, as it were, out of period for the original of this clavichord. But that's not hugely important because the Saxon clavichords of C.P. Bach's time were not so very hugely different from the later 18th century ones. Um, and this first movement of the F major sonata by C.P.E. Bach. I acquired this through an American harpsichordist who played in Cambridge many years ago now, actually, and I prepared the harpsichord for her performance on that occasion. She played this sonata, and I was so taken by it that I said after, so I said, you, you must be let me have a copy of it, could you? Oh, yes, yes, of course, you know. And so she, she duly sent me a, a photocopy. Uh, and as you can see, I mean, it's a photocopy of the original copper plate, 18th century engraving. And it is one of countless music manuscripts and uh, early editions in President Jefferson's own music collection. And there is a link, a web link, on the back of your programme if you happen to want to see what an extraordinary collector of musical scores Jefferson was. Uh, that will take you to the catalogue of his music collection. I don't know exactly where this came from, but this, this sonata is almost certainly, as I've put it, somewhere in the, the mid-1750s. <laughs>
So three uh, short pieces from this collection of CPE Bach, uh, confusingly called um, Petite Pièce pour le Clavecin. The pieces that I'm playing, or particularly La Burma, the, the one that I'm finishing with, it, it doesn't work on the harpsichord. You cannot really play it on the harpsichord, and it has dynamic markings from piano to fortissimo, and everything about it is clavichord, and of course, like everybody in the 18th century publishing music, uh, you know, you, you, you put it for the instrument that's going to sell the most copies, and the clavichord wasn't the instrument that would sell the most copies. So, La Frédérique. Almost certainly, I would think, wouldn't you, Frederick the Great? Highly unlikely that he would write a piece with that title that wasn't. But it's a very beautiful, gallant piece, which I think reflects rather Frederick's flute playing than it does his warmongering.
juggling, I'm, the softness of the instrument makes you almost think that the musician is playing it just for himself and no one else. So did that softness of sound influence its um, uh, use in large concert halls because you wouldn't be able to get a lot of people around uh, for a mass audience? No, they, they were never heard in, in large concert halls. They were primarily a domestic instrument. And of course, the small clavichords, which were the bedrock of musical training in the 17th and 18th centuries, um, every child would have learned their musical grammar on a little clavichord. So, I mean, even, even uh, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, all would have learned originally on a clavichord. All of them, all three of them, even Beethoven. And so, these instruments, yes, they're, they're very much intimate small space instruments and to try and to try and do this this room is very kind and i hope you know i, I think it, it it sounds well in here yeah. uh albeit drifting out of tune a bit by the end of the program but um but but yeah they are primarily a private domestic instrument for small gatherings and bernie's um visit to cpe bar in the 1770s in hamburg when he listened to C.P. Bach improvising on the clavichord for several hours and describes the drops of effervescence which distilled from his countenance. <laughs> uh, they're hard work, these instruments, to play. They are hard work. They take a lot of physical strength, but not force. It's totally different from playing a modern piano. There's no arm weight involved. Everything is from the fingers. And it is very, very intimate and very personal, yes. Um, gosh, <coughs> all instruments of this sort and, and period have particular areas of resonance which, which work particularly well. And, and the tessitura in the treble, for instance, of that Haydn slow movement, it, there's something about the sound of this instrument there, even a little bit out of tune, that it just seems... <coughs> And you cannot make a piano, even an early piano, and I mean, I play early pianos, I don't, don't generally play modern pianos these days, um, but you can't make a piano do that. A piano won't do that. And you can't colour... ..those colourations in... in and, and, yes, that fits the resonance of this instrument very nicely, so... Uh, yeah, in some ways, uh, that, that, was, that was a choice because it worked so well with the instrument, sure. With yes. the unique sound of the instrument, with modern technology, have they tried to incorporate it into a, you know, with the obviously bringing the volume up to incorporate it with other uh, instrumentation? No, no. And, and in fact, if you try to amplify, you, you virtually destroy the whole essence of the instrument, um, which is this very subtle, gentle sound. And the problem with any recording, um, with these sorts of instruments, whether harpsichords or clavichords, is particularly with the clavichord, is the sound is very, very harmonic rich in the notes because of where they're struck at the end of the vibrating length of the string. If you have notes which are very harmonic rich, the human ear picks that up and, as it were, welds it together into, into a sound. When you record, it's very, very difficult to record with sufficient fidelity or to, uh, you know, in, to, to um, amplify the sound with sufficient fidelity without losing that. And an obvious point, which many people don't know, uh, which is so important for anybody who records any of these early instruments, is that the fundamental of the bass notes doesn't exist. It's not there. It's inaudible. Because the sound box that's actually acting as the loudspeaker, if you like, the propagation of the sound, isn't long enough. The sound box has to be as long as the wavelength, at least as long as the wavelength of the note. And in the bass 
of a harpsichord, for instance, I mean, I can demonstrate it easily on a harpsichord, you can have a string vibrating, huge vibrations, absolutely totally silently once you've uh, damped out all the harmonics. So when you record it, of course, that harmonic content is so important because it's the harmonic, it's the fact in the bass that the harmonic series that you're hearing is incomplete. Our brains are amazingly clever. You, they, you hear, you wouldn't understand why, and I don't understand why, you hear an incomplete harmonic series and the brain puts in the fundamental for you. It completes what it hears as being an incomplete, naturally occurring sequence of, of harmonics. Um, and so if you record or if you amplify, you've got to do it with sufficient fidelity that that actually works, and, and it, it doesn't usually. If you listen to a recording of a harpsichord on a little radio or tiny little speakers or, you know, the little speakers you often get, say, on a laptop, um, because they're not able to reproduce for you that accuracy of harmonic content, you'll hear the sound as being rather thin and tinny. That's not because the recording might be faulty, it's because those loudspeakers aren't capable of actually giving you back what you would have heard from the instrument. Sorry, that's a long science lesson. But it, but it is just so fascinating that, that you know, I can have a class of primary school children with the harpsichord and show them that what they were listening to doesn't exist. And they go, what? <laughs> it's wonderful when you see children go, can't. And then you can prove it and they go, so...